So uh, today, I'm going to uh, be touching on a topic that hopefully is uh, pretty familiar with everyone. We're going to talk about the love of God. And I'm sure you've heard many, many sermons on, on the love of God. And, um, you know, I was uh, listening in Sunday school today, and hopefully I'll be able to touch on a few thoughts that were shared. We talked about duty. And uh, we talked about what it means to be called a disciple of Christ, to follow Him, and uh, the spirit that we should carry and um, how we should perform that, that duty while we are in the flesh. So uh, connecting those two things, the question I would have for you today is, um, how reliant are you on the love of God? So when we think about the love of God, the, the first image, the first thought, the thir first you know, word or name that should come to our mind is Jesus Christ. We know that the love of God was uh, manifest in Jesus Christ, that he would intervene for, for mankind, that we had been separated from our Lord um, through sin and iniquity, and a price had to be paid for us to be brought back into that, uh, that presence. So when we think about Jesus Christ, when we think about the salvation of our souls and the love of God, um, it's very easy to make that connection to um, baptism, to that, that baptism of both water and fire, that, that purification, the making of us being sanctified of, of saints unto our Lord. And the question is, do you remain reliant on that love? As we go into our walk, as we enter into our duty, do we continue to rely on the love of God? And to what degree? You know, it's the, it's the Christmas season, so um, I think we, it's, it's interesting, we go throughout the year and, um, you know, we, we speak of Christ quite a bit, and then it comes to, you know, December, and we start to talk about um, the, the story of Christ coming into the world. And uh, how did Christ come into the world? Someone shout it out. Virgin Mary, miraculously, as, as what? A baby. Right. So our, our Lord and Savior, the most important thing that he was to do um, while he was on the earth was to go to the cross, to be crucified for mankind and rise again. Yet when he came to earth, he did not come as a man ready to go to the cross. He came as a child. Why? It was very important that the love of God would be manifest in such a way that Christ would experience the entire human experience. To understand that we are to look to Christ not just at the cross, not just as we begin our walk, but through our entire lives in all aspects. Because He has experienced it all, He has overcome it all, and as it says in the Word, He is the author and finisher of our faith. So as I want to look at a couple pieces of scripture, and if you were in Sunday school today, we, we took a look at the seventh chapter of Alma. Our brother Bob brought that out, and um, I want to touch on the, the verses that he, he referenced. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start just um, a few verses back. I'll start in the 20th verse of the seventh chapter of Alma. So Alma is speaking to the people, and he's talking about this exact same topic. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about their need to rely on their Redeemer. But they were believers. These were not people that he was preaching, you know, repent, turn from your sinful ways. It was very much, you know, looking around the room today, it was very much like today. Individuals that came to listen to the word of God who believed in Christ and that he was encouraging them. And it says in the 20th verse, I perceive that it has been made known unto you by the testimony of his word that he cannot walk in crooked paths. Talking about the Lord. Neither doth he vary from which he hath said. Neither hath he shadow of turning from the right or to the left, or from that which is right to that which is wrong. Therefore his course is one eternal round. That path that we, has been set before us, there is one true path. There is one truth in this life. 
And he doth not dwell in unholy temples, neither can filthiness or anything which is unclean be received unto the kingdom of God. Therefore I say unto you, the time shall come, yea, and it shall be at the last day that he who is filthy shall remain in his filthiness. So it's talking about this importance of staying clean, relying upon the Lord and his sacrifice. And then it says in 22, And now, my beloved brethren, I have said these things unto you, that I might awaken you to your sense of duty to God, that ye may walk blameless before him, that ye may walk after the holy order of God, after which ye have been received. And I am confident as we have gathered together here on the, the Sabbath day in the Lord's house, this is where I find you. Believers of Christ looking forward to press forward to, to perform your duty, to carry that name of Christ. And, and maybe you come today and, and you're, you're confident in your walk and where you are and you're hoping to be an upliftment to others. Maybe you came and you know that you need some help, you need some strength, that you're hoping to receive something today to help carry you forward. But I believe we're all on that path. And this is the, the, the love of God. It, it command, he gives us commandment of how we would perform that duty. He says, And now I would that ye should be humble, and be submissive, and gentle, easy to be entreated, full of patience and long-suffering, being temperate in all things, being diligent in keeping the commandments of God at all times. So, you know, these are, these are teachings that you hear time and time again, that we should be submissive, that we should be meek, that we should be humble, that we should be serving. So the, the Lord is giving us commandments. These are things that we are supposed to do. This is a list of commandments. And I want to, you to really hone in on this next commandment. Asking for whatsoever thing ye sh shall stand in need, both spiritual and temporal. So we are to serve the Lord. We need to help other people. We need to carry a spirit. And we cannot forget to ask. We need to ask the Lord for help. Whatever it is that we are doing. And even as our, our brother brought forth in Sunday school about talking about our duty, when we're looking to serve God, sometimes we look inward too much. You know, we start to evaluate what we're doing while well, I, I, I hold this office and with Sunday school or MBA or within the branch or I'm going to oversee this initiative or, you know, I've read X amount of times this week or I've spent so many hours in prayer this week. We start to look too much inward when we think about our duty. We need to rely on the spirit and the love of God in all circumstances and whatever it is that we are to perform. If we're going to perform it unto the Lord, we need to do it perfectly. Who here is prepared to act perfectly? Christ is ready and he is willing. And he's, he's right there with us in all situations, ready to step in. But he's waiting. Waiting that we would ask for his help, both things temporal and spiritual. What a what, what wonderful love. You know, I, I, I go to work and I'm, I'm given a list of responsibilities and duties that I need to perform and things that I need to do and checklists. And very rarely do I have a supervisor that says, and oh, by the way, if you have trouble with any of this, I'll do it for you. Just, just give me a call. I'll step in. But that is our Savior. So he's called us to perform a duty. But the thing is, that duty is for our own benefit. He wants us to have better marriages, to be better parents, to be better friends. So what does he ask us to do? Love unconditionally. Forgive others. Help those that are in need. And if you have trouble with that, lean on me. Lean on me, because I went to the cross. I took the stripes. I took the nails. I took all the sins of the world that I am available, that I am accessible that I live this entire life that you can look to, that there is nothing that you have to do alone. I'm going to touch on another piece of scripture. It's the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. You've probably heard it a million times. Though I speak with the tongues of uh, men and angels, 
I have not, and, and have not charity, I have become as sounding brass and of tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And you can go on to the eighth verse that says, Charity never <coughs> faileth. The love of God. That's what it's talking about here in charity. It's not charity of giving to the poor. It's not charity of loving your companion. It is talking about the love of God. And it comes from one place. It doesn't come from us. It comes from our Redeemer. That it doesn't matter how well we speak or we could, we could testify to many. We could go door to door handing out pamphlets. What matters most of all is that when we leave this life and our God looks upon us, that His love is within us. That we rely on Him. That we petition Him. He, he says this time and time again. Ask of me. If you fall short, pray unto me. If you feel not strong enough, go to my ministry. Have them pray for you if you can't pray for yourself. If, if you can't come into the ministry, we can anoint a handkerchief and send it to you. What, by any means, you need to tap into that love of God. Because as it says here, you could speak with the tongues of angels. You could prophesy. It does not matter. In the 8th verse it continues, But whatsoever there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now that might be a little confusing, because we, in the Church of Jesus Christ, we believe in the manifestation of God's Spirit in prophecy, and in preaching, and in knowledge. So how is it possible that these things that God would give to us would go away? It says, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. See, these things that we do, it's, it's a type and shadow. You know, we take part in communion as a, as a point of remembrance. You know, we stand up here and we speak these words that you would be stirred unto that, what, that day when you were touched by the Lord. You know, we get these bits and pieces throughout this life. But it says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When we enter into the presence of God, it's not going to matter about prophecy. It's not going to matter about revelation. It's not going to matter about, you know, the scriptures. We're going to be in his presence. We're going to receive all. And something that's truly miraculous in this day and time is that the church of Jesus Christ has been given the fullness of the gospel, has been given an understanding that there will be a day and time when that, what exactly what's being described here, this perfectness, is going to happen upon the face of the earth. That there will be a city set aside on a hill. That Christ will be there. It, we know that he'll be here there because it says that his presence will be so bright that there'll be no need for light in that kingdom. And we will know perfectly. And again, when, when uh, you're entering into that city, when you're called to go up that mountain, it doesn't matter what your religious resume was it was do you carry the love of God within you and it's our responsibility to be a light to others and, and encourage others to rely on him in every part of your life and baptism is just the first step it's that step out on faith of do you really trust the love of God do you really believe in that story that you've been told is it real unto you and then as we continue in our lives, we get to rely on that spirit more and more. And we build a closer relationship with him. I know Sister Terry has a, has a wonderful habit that I try to uh, emulate in my life, and hopefully you do the same. As God touches her and gives her miracles, she writes them down. She has a book of miracles, of many, three books. Three books. Is Christ not the author and finisher of those books. That we would rely on these things, that we would build this beautiful story. There's so many things in this life that we are looking forward to.
It says that um, in the seventh verse of that seventh chapter, it says, for behold, I say unto you, there be many things to come. You know, when, when we're young, we think about those many things. You know, will I find a companion? Will I find a career? Will I, you know, have children? Will I have friends? Will I own a home? There's so many things in this life to look forward to. And it says, and behold, there is one thing which is of more importance than all. For behold, the time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. That we would be found to have that love within us. That is the only thing of importance in this life. And we are so distracted from day to day. Uh, we talked about that in Sunday school, how we, we fail to remember what we had for dinner two days ago. And how we have to be re, uh, reminded of the goodness of God. That it's important that we express our testimonies. That we read those miracles. That we think just, you know, when's the last time you stopped and you thought about the day of your baptism? <clears throat> Remember the, the minister that took you into the water. Remember hanging on to his arm as he raised his. Remember looking at the shore and seeing those faces and what it felt like to be dipped in that water and to be brought back up, made clean and new. When's the last time you really thought on that and felt that love of God? That everything you've done in your life up to that point did not matter that you were perfect and all the Lord wanted to do was redeem you so that he could embrace you and that he could love you. So I, I don't do a perfect job. I am distracted every single day. But the message that I felt on my heart for myself and hopefully that you would receive is that we must rely upon him each and every day. We need to passionately seek out that love in time of meditation, in time of prayer, and, and asking the Lord to work through us because it becomes even more real when we're able to touch the lives of someone else and they feel the love of Christ through us. It emphasizes that perfect love because without charity, without the love of God, we are nothing. May God bless you. enjoyed the words of my brother, um, and I think they fit along with where some of my thoughts were uh, this morning. Uh, there's, been a, there's been a hymn on my mind, and uh, maybe we can sing it later. Um, it was, uh, I'll show you maybe a little bit of how I was. We, we did some new member training with the, with the young people yesterday, uh, Brother Dan, Brother Bobby, and I, and we, we were talking a little bit about how we were, right, when the, the habits we had when we were young. Um, one of the habits, I'd, I'd say probably not, not the best one, uh, my favorite song to call when I was a young person was number 343. Does anybody know that song? It's Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Do you know why that was my favorite song? Because it was two lines and it got the meeting over quicker and I could get home. <laughs> and, uh, but, but honestly, that song has been on my mind, the, the simplicity of it. If you don't know the hymn, it, it is literally two lines. Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. And, you know, at the time of the year that we're in, Thanksgiving, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about you know, the blessings we have, what God's done for us. And um, I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not one for the, the traditions. She went downstairs, so I'll, I'll, I'll poke at her a little bit. My, my sister always makes us go around the table and say what we're thankful for. This year she made us write it on cards and we played a guessing game. And uh, it's not, not my favorite tradition, not because I don't love th thanking God. It's just it gets a little cheesy at times, right? This time she challenged us to not say family or, or uh, you know, the, our, our jobs or the things that we typically say or Jesus. Uh, don't, say, don't say those things. Uh, I, I racked my brain. I think I was the last person to fill out my card. Maybe other than my grandmother, I think it took her a little while to figure out what we were, what we were trying to do. And I think she ended up listing off, what, a half a dozen things, Steph? Um, but what I, what I wrote down was God's love. I, I couldn't think of anything else. I couldn't think of something deeper. I couldn't think of something more meaningful or, or not as, you know, cliche or things like that. But I think that's a good thing because that's what I am most thank thankful for in my life is God's love. 
And when I think of the many blessings in our life, and, and you know, we, we, like the song says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And I think that's something that our, our brother was getting at, that, that love that God has towards us, um, it's never ending. And there's a phrase I'll, I'll get to, but before I get to that, that scripture, there, there's a simple scripture in, in James, I think it's one we've probably all heard before, and he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So when you think in your life, you think of all the good that you've received. And yes, it can be natural. Maybe it's some of the, some of the gifts you've been given. I, I always, uh, often when we, when we do that around the, the circle, I, I thank God for my, for my job. It seems simple. It's not, uh, maybe not spiritual, but it allows me to provide for my family. It allows my wife to focus on raising our children. Uh, it allows me to not have to worry about the natural things of this world. Uh, and it allows me to focus more on God. And I, I know, and I could give you my testimony of, of uh, even from a, uh, a college student uh, just looking for an internship and the way that God directed step after step after step. Uh, got the internship, through that met somebody that, uh, that I worked with that introduced me to my now wife. Um, through that I got hired uh, full time in, in the middle of uh, a recession with a full on hiring freeze in the company, no, no head count open. Uh, they hired one person that year and it was, it was me. And so I could, I could look at the, you know, even the natural things, the way that God directs us. Um, and, and I can't help but think of that. that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Um, and it cometh down from the Father of lights. And uh, we heard this a little bit this morning, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I think the, the scripture our brother read talked about, he doesn't turn to the left, he doesn't turn to the right. That same God that provided for, uh, for, for person after person in the scriptures, all the accounts we read, all the, all the miracles that he, that he performed, uh, it's that same God that we serve today. It's the same source for everything good that we have today. And when I think on those things, then what, what, is that, what does that then maybe make us do? It makes us think a little bit about what we, what we owe back, right? It makes us think about our duty. And I know I shared this verse uh, a few weeks ago, I think Brother Dan in Sunday school. Um, it talks about uh, all, all good things, but it says that uh, anything that enticeth us to do good continually, that, that's from God. So even after we, we recognize, hey, all the good I have in my life, everything that, uh, that is a blessing, I recognize it's from God. That should spur you to want to do good, to want to be better. It should uh, awaken you to that sense of duty your brother uh, felt directed to, to share with us this morning. And how do we test that? It's easy. Everything that enticeth us to do good, everything that wants us to do something good, it's from God. Simple as that. And it goes on to say, uh, everything which invited invite to, do, to do good um, and to love God and to serve him uh, is, in, is inspired of God. And earlier, bef before that, the verse before, it says that, um, uh, and that which is evil cometh of the devil, for the devil is an enemy of God and fighteth against him continually. So we know that even in that, we can, we can be in a position where we recognize all the good I have is from God. We can be in a position where I say, well, I, I feel to do good, and I know that's God directing me. Uh, we know the evil one is always coming at us, right? We know that he's always trying to encircle us about with darkness, with things that might distract us, with things that might weigh us down. I, I know for me, the more I try to, uh, try to do good, I feel like that's when the distractions come more. That's when uh, some of those things come, uh, you know, come around us. And uh, there's, a, there's a chapter, I, I believe uh, our brother, brother Bob shared this uh, several weeks ago uh, in, in Sunday school. Um, but it's in Elma, chapter 26. Uh, and in this, in this chapter, if you, if you don't know, uh, this is after um, they were laboring amongst the Lamanites and they had some success. And, uh, and Ammon says, uh, he says what, what great blessings has he bestowed upon us? Can you tell? He says, can you tell? Do you know what the blessings that God's done for us? And he goes on to talk about the thousands of souls that they converted. And I know for me, that feels overwhelming. I think it was even mentioned at my ordination. There are thousands of souls. I don't feel equipped to do that. I don't feel equipped to address, uh, I don't even feel necessarily worthy to address the congregation here, the, the couple dozen that are here. When I think of, of thousands of souls, uh, that, that is overwhelming to me. I'm not, I'm not good enough for that. Uh, but it goes on to say, and, and this is where I think we get that strength. And it mentions that thousands of souls a few times, but this is my, when I think of the love of God, this is maybe one of my favorite phrases in the scripture that talks about it. Um, it says, again, referring to the, to the Lamanites, their brethren, it says they were encircled about with everlasting darkness and destruction. When I think of that phrase, does that not make you think of the world that we're in today? 
So I'm not making you think of those out there that are around us. Maybe good people. Maybe deep down good people. But it says they're encircled about by, by darkness and destruction. We spent a day yesterday in fasting and prayers at church. Praying for the world. Praying for, uh, for Israel. Praying for, for the, the things that we're seeing. The wars, the rumors of wars as we read and quote often. Um, thinking about that darkness and destruction. But he goes on to say... Uh, but behold, he has brought them to the everlasting light. Yea, into everlasting salvation. Our brother talked about that salvation this morning. That's that ultimate gift, that ultimate blessing, that ultimate display of love. But again, th this next phrase is maybe my favorite. And they were encircled about with the matchless bounty of his love. What better way to describe God's love? But a matchless bounty. That means there's no equal. That means there's nothing that can stand up against it. That means it's never ending. It means no matter how much I might fall short, no matter how much I might let him down, no matter how much I might not be worthy, that bounty of love is gonna be right there. When I think of, uh, when I think of his, his grace, I, I gave a, a, little, a little speech on this with, uh, with the camp in that Brother, Brother Dan was a part of, uh, what was that, two or three years ago, 2020, we did the camp in uh, during COVID. Uh, and I talked about grace, and I talked about, uh, I, I think of like an old time scale that you put weights on and it balances out. And every sin I put on there, his grace balances it out. Every way I fall short, his bounty, bounty of love balances that scale out. I think it was our sister this morning that said, we, we, you know, we're perfect, but he makes up that gap, right? There's a gap between us and what he wants us to be, and his love is what fills that gap. And it goes on in this, in this chapter, you know, they, they accuse Ammon of boasting, and he says, well, I, I bo if I boast, I boast in my God. Uh, it's, a, it's another favorite, favorite scripture of mine. Um, but he goes on to say uh, some of what they did when they labored. And I mentioned that all, you know, God is going entice to entice us, enticeth us to do good. Um, and uh, he says, we have, we've entered into their houses, and we taught them. Uh, we've taught in the streets. Uh, we've taught, taught upon the hills. We've entered into the temples and synagogues and taught them. He's saying, God, you, you directed us to do good, and we, we did that. And what do you think the answer is? They were blessed, right? Thousands of souls. Well, it says, we've been cast out and mocked and spit upon and smote upon our cheeks. We've been stoned and taken and bound with strong cords and cast into prisons. And through the power wisdom of God, we have been delivered again. So we might feel God's blessings in our life. We might be able to recognize that all good comes from him. We might be directed to do good. We might fulfill that. We might feel good in our lives. And just as those, our brother and that, their brethren that were surrounded by darkness, uh, they, they had a lot of trials. I know I go in my life, uh, I, can, I can preach, I can teach, I can, I can try to share the gospel with my loved ones. I'm pretty confident I'm not going to get uh, stoned. I'm not going to get thrown into prison. Uh, I'm not going to be bound with strong cords. Um, I, I've not, not been spit upon yet. That might feel a little more realistic. But uh, there's things in here that we, we're not going to experience. But there's one person that went through all that. And I think of Jesus Christ, like our brother said. I think of the, the suffering he went through. You mentioned the stripes. You mentioned the nails. You mentioned the suffering that he went through. And I love this, this, this verse. Um, he, uh, Ammon says, And we suffered all manner of afflictions, and all this, that perhaps we might by the means of saving some soul. What's missing in that? There's no S at the end of that. He didn't say by the means that we might save thousands. He didn't say, I went all through this because I was promised we were going to save the world. He said, we went through this with the expectation or the hope that we might save some soul. And it says, we suppose our joy would be full if perhaps we would be the means of saving some. And I think of the parallel to Jesus Christ when he went to the cross. He didn't go there. He didn't suffer through the things that our brother mentioned with the expectation that he was going to save all of mankind. Now, he knew, he knew that was what it was for. We know that, that Christ died for us. But that wasn't, the, that wasn't the, the whole of it. He didn't say, well, I'm, I'm only doing this because it's for everybody. I believe when he climbed up on that cross, when he took that, that shame and that suffering, when you think of someone that was spit upon and smote on their cheeks and stoned and cast in the prison, that, that it completely encompasses what he went through. But he did it by the means of saving some soul. 
And that soul is you. We sing the song, uh, One Drop of Blood Just For Me. And I want you to personalize that this morning. Our brother talked about how often do you really sit and think about the sacrifice God made for you. Well, you're that soul. You're that single soul that he died for. And if you haven't given your life yet to him, that's what I want you to think about. Because until you decide to make Jesus your choice, that death was in vain. And I want you to personalize it this morning. For those that have given your life to Christ, think about the labor that you're to perform. Think about the sacrifice he made for just you. And think about how you could be that for maybe one person. Maybe you're not, you're not sent here to, to convert thousands. Maybe it's just your one neighbor. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe it's bringing her to a Friday night to, to build some gingerbreads. You don't know how that might impact that soul, that singular soul. And so I, I just want to, I want to stir you up in that. Remember the gifts that God's given us, the many blessings that he has, and remember that it all comes from him. And let that spur you, spur you up to that sense of your duty, our brother mentioned this morning, to want to do good. And remember that Jesus Christ died for you. You specifically. Even if it was just you that he would have saved, I believe he still would have climbed on that cross. Even if it was said, oh, but everybody, no one needs this but, but Brian. I, th I believe he still would have went up there. He still would have went through the pain. He still would have went to the suffering and said, well, I, I did it for, for him. Have that sense about you. Have that memory in your mind. We talked this morning about maybe not always remembering things. Remember the blessings. If you don't write them down, I, I'm terrible at remembering things. I need to, to start writing books. Uh, I don't know if I'd have three, but I know I'd have some. Uh, thank God for, uh, for God directing our sister to do that. I think of the, of the blessings that's going to be for generations from now when they go back and read those things. Um, may God awaken you to a sense of your duty, but also a remembrance of all that he's done for you in your life. And remember that he died for you and you specifically, and that his love is a matchless bounty. So may God bless you, bless you this morning. Turn to number 37 in our uh, branch favorites. <coughs> <coughs>